NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union. NC Impact is a production of UNC-TV Public Media North Carolina in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government. Access to healthy water and wastewater services can be a struggle for some rural communities. Clogged pipe, a backed up toilet, the storm drains overflowing. How three towns are working together to give their residents clean water and sanitation. This is NC Impact. I'm Anita Brown Graham. Welcome to NC Impact. This week, we're looking at how communities are coming together to address significant water and wastewater challenges. Joining us today are Kim Colson, Director of the State's Division of Water Infrastructure, Gloristine Brown, Mayor of the Town of Bethel, North Carolina, and Greg Gaskins, Secretary of the North Carolina Local Government Commission. Before we go to our panelists, let's visit with a business owner in Elkin, North Carolina, who learned clean water is not something we can take for granted. NC Impact's David Hurst reports. Is there any more to go? Is that it? Teresa Smith has run Harry's Place in Elkin for 20 years. Time for lunch. As the town grew, so did her business. It was a barber shop, and then my father turned it into a package store, and then it evolved into a restaurant. So I kind of, 20 years ago, I inherited it from my parents who passed away. Smith also inherited some challenges like how to best limit waste coming from the kitchen. And that's when the folks from the newly formed sewer authority came by. I was, in, you know, informed, Teresa, you really need to put a grease trap in your, you know, that's a very important thing, just out of your water from your sinks. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm too busy working to even know all that stuff. But what goes out must come in and wastewater is treated, providing us with the water we use. Smith says the water for her restaurant is just as important as her grill. When the water gets turned off for whatever reason, I, I, I can't exist. Um, that, that has happened maybe one time. We've had to shut the restaurant down immediately. I don't remember when, but it was like, oh no, I just remembered how important it is to have water. <laughs> kind of take it for granted. But right here, you can see what, what's going to the river. The towns of Elkin, Jonesville, and Rhonda came together to officially create the Yadkin Valley Sewer Authority in 2006. The fire fire, they settled to the bottom. The authority handles both sewer and wastewater treatment across the three towns. Everybody was just good people from all three towns and worked together, and we didn't have standing up, shouting across the table at each other, ever. It was all always good, and I, it was the people. That's what it was. For Smith, the sewer authority takes care of her water and waste and allows her to focus on growing her business. It just seems, it makes my life much easier running this restaurant because they're on speed dial. Kim, I want to start with you. Most of us do not wake up in the middle of the night thinking about water and wastewater in part because we have no idea how expensive this infrastructure can be. Can you walk us through some of the challenges you see for communities that are trying to provide this infrastructure? Sure, and those challenges differ between our urban areas and our rural areas. The urban areas have high growth and they're dealing with capacity issues. Our rural systems are really dealing with some uh, hard economic challenges in those communities. That can lead to fewer customers. Customers are using less water. A lot of manufacturing plants, plants have closed, and those are large water users as well. So all of that leads to less revenue. At the same time, expenses are always going up. Construction costs are increasing as these towns try to replace aging infrastructure. Chemical costs are increasing, and they're trying to retain qualified staff. So all of this can lead to rate pressure and affordability issues in many of these communities. That's, th that's why we're starting to see a lot of communities starting to work together more and more. It's wonderful to see that kind of collaboration. And of course, Glorstein, you're talking to mayors of communities of all sizes in North Carolina and recognize that when we talk about the challenges, the cost challenges, we're not just talking about the cost to build the system. Could you talk a little bit about the challenges in trying to have regular maintenance and operations for these systems? 
Yes, thank you, Anita. Uh, as Kim uh, talked about some of the challenges as well, but being in a rural community with our staff, staff is, I think, sometimes key because when you are in a small town, you do not have the proper uh, staff people to do. Uh, it, it inquires, as speaking to my public works director, there's a lot of things that need to be done, but when you have so many other jobs that are included into your day-to-day -day operations, um, you cannot totally focus on the needs of what is what it takes to run a system. You know, there are so many things that will go lacking. You will oversee because you're so busy, and then that can cause a problem. So I think, with, along with what Kim said, staffing and then having to uh, making sure that you have your just I'll say chlorine, just have, making sure that the chemicals are, are there and, and on time and reported. So those are, are the things that can cause a huge problem, especially in small rural towns. So Greg, we've heard of fiscal challenges, some um, just staff capacity challenges, getting products in on time. Help us understand what is the extent of the problem here? How, do we know how many systems are unable to fund and support the infrastructure needed? And, and if you know, how do you know? How are you evaluating these systems? Uh, we probably don't know exactly, but we uh, do know a lot about the people that are experiencing these difficulties. Uh, the local government commission, which I work for, um, has the responsibility of oversight for 1,300 units of government in North Carolina, the entire state. And we're a service entity to provide help and assistance to those units. And uh, through that process, we developed something called the unit assistance list to help us identify people who were having problems in areas with internal control, compliance with statutes, uh, and particularly with their funding and their water sewer fund and in their general fund. And through this, we know that there are 60 plus units that are experiencing some difficulty uh, that may lead to the exact kind of infrastructure problems that Kim was talking about uh, in their units of government. And it's not just the unit of government, of course, it's the citizens, the people uh, in those communities that we're concerned about. So if you take what we know, there's probably 35 to 40 counties we know are affected now. Uh, the unit assistance list has, has had as many as 155 units on it, wow. uh, which is more like 55 counties. And we are working on a system to try to do a predictive analysis, just like the folks are at DEQ and Kim staff. And we think on that analysis, there may be more like 75 or 80 counties that are on that. In other words, units of government in those 80 counties. What that means is this is not a local problem. This is a problem for the entire state and all the people of the state. And we are doing this evaluation to try to pinpoint who we need to help. Well, we're going to come back and talk a bit more about that. Let's go to the second story. The Yadkin Valley Sewer Authority may be a utility provider, but many in the community view them as more than just a service. Let's take a look. To make a good cup of coffee, John Cheek says clean water is crucial. When he opened Dirty Joe's Coffee Shop three years ago, the water was a concern. Coming into the location, it was a hair salon. Uh, Chemicals, chemicals were kind of harsh. Yeah, I remember that next time I need some help. Right? But Cheek found that the new sewer authority was able to quickly assess and fix the leak and prevented wastewater issues that could have spelled trouble. Had we not had the Yakin Valley Sewer Authority here, I would have been setting in just basically doing it ourselves and having to, to front that money and you know, not the town having to take care of it. Maybe we would have waited and they would have delayed my opening. Before the sewer authority, towns individually managed water treatment and wastewater handling. They decided to join forces because the towns were losing money, making it difficult to maintain and improve local systems. It saves us money by being able to do that, by having, and also the other towns being able to help fund the sewer authority. It, it, it keeps us out of the sewer business, which means we don't have to have the personnel or the benefits that go along with that. 
For Cheek, he remembers having to rely on wells for his water before the authority was created. He says the authority isn't just a service, but has become an important member of the community. So well water, you know, you, you, you have, you, you don't know if there's chemicals in it. You don't know what's going into your well. And with these guys, you do. I mean, it's, it's pretty nice to, to know that they are looking out for us and keeping our water safe. Glorstein, we saw in the video one small town business owner getting the quick assistance he needed. <clears throat> Tell us, how does a community provide that level of service? And doing what they did by joining that authority, having that authority. But when you in a small town, we do try, we have our citizens reaching out to us with problems. We do try to answer the call as fast as we can, as soon as we can. And sometimes you just have to, it depends on the situation. You do have to reach out to your neighboring community to come in and say, help, we need help. But I think in when in small ones, you're having these issues in small towns. I'm, I think merging, you need to consider merging with a larger uh, uh, town or city that has all of the amenities that you need that they can come to the rescue. I mean, quick, fast, and in a hurry and get the job done most likely within that day, within that time frame. But when you're small and working with a small staff of people, it's hard to, you know, and especially if you have multiples uh, uh, breakage or pipes bursting or whatever, but I think that's the way to go because you know that this, mer by merging, you don't have to worry about it. They have the tools to do what small towns, what you don't have to, to put, you know, to get things taken care of. So I, I think that's the way that communities can help by looking, again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a strong advocate for, for merging uh, small towns looking at merging. I love hearing you say this. And so let me just ask you to share some inside scoop with us, if you will. Do, <laughs> do you hear more mayors of small towns saying, in order to achieve scale, we do have to combine with other small towns or combine with big cities? Are you hearing more of that conversation these days? <laughs> I am to some extent. I have ran into some you know, some people sitting on the fence. But when I tell my story, because I, I, I'm going to preach it, uh, because it's, in some feel that they may lose control, but the point of it is you may lose control anyway at the end of the day if you do not have things in place. So why not work on it now <clears throat> to make sure that your citizens are going to be taken care of then down the road when there's so much chaos you don't know which way to turn. But I think, I believe some of the mayors are coming around, with, you know, because they're being, getting frustrated and it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work when you don't have the tools in place. And I don't have any doubt when you tell your story, you tell it in a very compelling way. <laughs> so Greg, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what the state has in place to support these communities in need of financial, technical, or regulatory assistance. Uh, absolutely. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's uh, uh, there's something called the unit assistance list, which is simply the way that we identify who these people are. And we are looking at the uh, demographics of those communities. Uh, Kim mentioned earlier that we know that uh, economically, uh, some places in North Carolina are being challenged because of lost industry and they've lost citizens. And uh, that creates an issue where they have less revenue than they might otherwise have to help support their utilities. So we're tracking all that and, and tr making contact with these communities. And uh, five years ago, we created something called a coach team. These are people that work uh, with us in our division and they go out to try to help these communities identify these problems on a financial side and help them with their accounting issues, with their, in, in many cases, their, their issues of interpreting the law as it applies to them. And through that, we try to help them uh, overcome those hurdles, get the information that's required uh, so that they can file their annual reports on time, which is absolutely essential for them to get uh, financial grants 
and uh, loans from uh, Kim's group, the State Water Infrastructure Authority, which I'm also a member of, and, and provide them with assistance with their infrastructure. So in addition to doing that, we're also doing training on a regular basis for the finance officers in these communities to help them. And we're working with a number of other entities like the uh, School of Government uh, on training with the League of Municipalities Association of County Commissioners so that people have a better understanding of what their problems are. So it, it is a constant uh, effort on our part to try to stay ahead of the problems and work with people uh, like Bethel uh, to try to solve their problems. Thank you, Greg. So Kim, if I'm a viewer <clears throat> watching this show, I might be thinking, all right, I don't, you know, I turn on the tap, the water comes, it goes down the drain. What does all of this have to do with me? So while these types of challenges may be high on a community's priority list, I'm wondering if you might just help our viewers at home better understand why should they care about water infrastructure? Sure. Well, I think you've already heard from us, some of these small businesses in our stories how much it's really a, a cornerstone of our economy. And it's also a cornerstone of our public health. You know, I think I've come to appreciate that even more so this year as we deal with the pandemic and the impacts that has uh, when we have a public health crisis on our daily lives and on our economy. You think back to the 1800s when industrialization was taking place, our cities and towns were growing. Back then, diarrhea and dysentery were the third leading cause of death. Typhoid fever outbreaks were routine. Um, so we had these public health crises that were routine, not once in a lifetime. Harvard researchers documented that the greatest decline in mortality rates in the United States were from 1900 to 1940 and that clean water was a major reason for that decline. So water infrastructure is absolutely critical to both our public health and our economy. Yeah, and of course, when you have it, clean water, you have it, and when you don't, that's when you, that's when you worry about it. The Yadkin Valley Sewer Authority inherited aging infrastructure, but now they have the resources and the vision to build for the future. And C Impact's David Hurst reports. This line is probably, I don't know, I would say 50 years old. Growing up, Alvin Hayes never thought he'd be in the sewer business. A one gallon spiel. But after seeing his community's aging sewer system, he realized he could help make a difference in providing clean and safe water. Old septic tanks, can you imagine what they look like now when they were built back in the 50s and, and things, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a blessing for even our community to have wastewater and city water. The owners of Dodge City owns that one. Owns community that. leaders began addressing the area's aging wastewater infrastructure in 2001. Early in the conversations, they realized it would be a challenge to get what they wanted at a price they could afford. Sewer plants are extremely expensive. They are not the sexy, exciting thing that uh, some, some towns are able to do, but when you flush that thing, you want it to work and you want it to go away. You don't want it to come back. You have wastewater coming out. The concerns among leaders included not only residential and commercial needs, but also the environmental impact of unintended wastewater spills. Somewhere down the stream, somebody's getting affected by it. To come up with solutions to these issues, the three-town board needed someone to lead the authority. So in 2010, they hired Nicole Johnston. Johnston says the first five years were a challenge creating a sewer authority from scratch. I do know the first few years I struggled to get the money and I even called Elkin that pays us the most. Hey, can you pay us a week early so I can meet our payroll? We're past that now. Johnston seeks grants from the state and federal government she says it's been an uphill battle to fix or replace all the outdated sewer lines and systems, but says they're making progress. We failed the first three or four years that I tried to apply and we didn't get the funding, but we went back, went and met with the state, went to Raleigh and said, hey, tell me how to do this, to tell us what to do. And by doing that, we, I've learned a lot. For Hayes, he says this work often goes unnoticed until there's a problem. But he says those in the community are starting to notice the positive work being done 
and the partnerships that make it all possible. I just love it. It's not so much a service as wastewater. We serve the entire community in any way we can. You gotta love that. So Greg, what advice would you give to a town in search of support as they try to get themselves to a point where they can invest in their aging infrastructure? I think clearly the first thing is uh, to work with us, to work with SWEA, to identify if you know you've got a problem, uh, then reach out to us. Uh, let's try to talk about that problem. Uh, the, the greatest scope of this is, is that as we have been working on it, particularly over the last five years, uh, the SWEA board and staff, the LGC and staff have been trying to come up with solutions. And one of those solutions is to, uh, to use the, the tools that are there, uh, the grants and loans, but more than that, with this identification, to try to make sure that we can look for different ways to try to turn something that is not sustainable because it has a lack of funds to an entity that is sustainable. And legislation was passed by the General Assembly, the Viable Utilities Reserve in 2020, to create some money for us to start doing that. And I think that makes a huge difference because Absolutely. to target something specifically to make these people viable did not exist before that legislation passed. That is, so that's what I think the future is. That is terrific news. So, Kim, I'm gonna ask you the next question and it goes to something that Mayor Brown talked about at the very beginning in terms of just staff capacity. Over the next five years, the water industry will lose approximately 50% of its water and wastewater systems operation specialist, right? The people who do the work. <clears throat> How can we attract individuals to these career pathways, especially underrepresented populations? And this comes from Carolyn. Yeah, and that's really, really important. When we developed our master plan to meet our state's water infrastructure needs, we really focused on three areas, the infrastructure, the finances, but also the organizational capacity. So retaining those staff is really crucial in really those long-term solutions that we're looking at. I know it's a lot of it's, uh, you, you think about, you know, the, the lady said that wastewater treatment plants are not sexy, but it really can be an interesting field. Um, and we do need more and more people in that field. I know I got involved in water infrastructure somewhat accidentally. I liked biology, I liked engineering. Um, and those lead right into the water industry. So we've got to work hard with our universities, and I think more importantly with our college, um, community college system as well, so that we have the people we need, we have the workforce, but we've also got to provide those viable utilities that can pay those and retain those workers. And so let me stay with you, Kim, for this next question. What practices do you think we'll have to take to protect community water systems from the effects of climate change? Well, I think resiliency is a really a difficult issue for a lot of our rural communities because they're, they're so focused on just surviving today and, and meeting their needs today. But there has to be more of a planning aspect with a lot of our smaller systems. And some of them have been really impacted by recent hurricanes. So I think resiliency is something that we've got to start focusing more and more on. Um, for our funding program, it's becoming more and more of a priority to direct funds that not only just help replace infrastructure, but replace it in a smart way that maybe moves it out of a floodplain or, or something along those lines. I'm gonna end with a question to you, Glorstein. Um, what do you think is motivating Greenville to partner with Bethel? <laughs> it feels like the perfect question to end with. <laughs> well, um, I guess I'm hoping that they can see, foresee the future. I think Bethel um, has a chance to, to thrive a little more than what we are doing now. Uh, things are beginning to happen. And I do see uh, for the future that uh, we do have, uh, I'm very optimistic. Um, I think things, we are near uh, 64, that I'm hoping that will turn into an interstate which entails that could uh, help our economic growth within the community and the surrounding area of Bethel. And uh, like uh, Mr. 
like they were saying, the base that we once had here in many years ago before me, we don't have now. But I think with uh, people seeing that, okay, Bethel is going to become, hopefully become a part of Greenville or Greenville Utilities, that, yeah, I think we can put something there that could thrive and having the traffic to come from 64, you know, out coming from I-95 this way, that Bethel has something to offer. So I think they they see they see in that crystal ball that uh, Bethel still has a chance. I, I, I really believe that. I love it. This show is all about win-win collaborations, and this sounds like <laughs> a perfect example. Kim Colson, Mayor Glorstein Brown, Greg Gaskins, thank you so much for spending this time with us, and thank you for watching and engaging. There are solutions available to us if we work together. Tell us what your community is doing or how we can help you. Email us at ncimpact at unc.edu or message us on Twitter or Facebook. And you can always, always join the conversation on Facebook Live. Coming up on NC Impact, manufacturing is facing a skills gap across our state and it's leaving thousands of positions open. How a three county initiative is helping create a talent pipeline for local employers. NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union. NC Impact is a production of UNC-TV in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government.